Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Allure Treasury Experience. The Allure team and our trusted software partners are so excited to share these two days of virtual learning and networking with you. My name is Jordan Fuger Burmeister. I'm the marketing manager at Allure, and I will be moderating today's keynote. Before we begin, a couple of housekeeping items. Be sure to join the Allure Treasury Experience group on LinkedIn, as well as engage with us using the hashtag ETE2020 on Twitter. We will be doing a $200 Amazon gift card drawing from those that use the hashtag. During our presentations, all attendees will be placed on mute. Any questions can be submitted via the chat to panelists or the Q&A. We will do a live Q&A at the end of each presentation. A recording of these sessions, as well as a copy of the PDF slides, will be available via a digital library following the event. Also, for those attending for CTP or CCM credits, a link to the assessments will be sent during the Q&A portion of those presentations. With that said, we're gonna go ahead and get started with our keynote, Building the Digital Treasurer, Understanding the Changing Global Treasury Landscape with Seth Marlowe. Seth Marlowe is a Senior Vice President and Strategist with Wells Fargo's Strategic Advisory Group. He's a thought leader on treasury, technology, and innovation. He joined Wells Fargo in 2010 and has served in a number of roles, including treasury, sales, and product management. Prior to joining the bank, Seth has held positions at GE, Danone, Praxair, PepsiCo, and ENY. Seth sits on the board of directors of the Treasury Management Association of New York. He also holds CTP, AAP, and APPSC accreditations. He has a BA in mathematics from Binghamton University and an MBA MIS from the University at Albany. With that, I will hand it over to Seth. Great, and good morning. Uh, good morning, Jordan. Good morning, everybody that's joining us, uh, hopefully all over the country. I'm very excited to, to be here this morning and uh, to uh, kick off what I, I think should be uh, a, a really exciting content-filled two days uh, for everybody that's attending. So it, it, it's really exciting. Um, so, um, you know, as you see, I've got a couple of digital assistants working with me today. I promise I'm keeping them on mute, um, but just in case they're sort of like my security blanket. Um, so let, let's, get, let's get right into it. Um, so I'm going to um, pose a, a first question to you, which is, are you being disrupted? Is your company being disrupted? Um, and is treasury being disrupted? And you know, interestingly, if you take a look at this, this chart, and, and this is from uh, a survey done by The Economist in their uh, intelligence unit, and boy, that's a group I'd love to be a part of. Um, they, they, they put this uh, question out, and the survey came back showing that 76% of the respondents felt that in one way, shape, or form, their business was being or would be disrupted in some way. And 55 of them thought it was going to be fairly significant disruption. So, you know, as that, as the beginning of the backdrop of the story of the digital treasurer, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll continue plowing through. Um, so I want to share with you some, what I describe as C-suite insights. And some, you know, interesting numbers here. This was uh, quoted uh, by Prevedir. Um, based on a, a Forrester research study, and, and that contains somewhere around 400 uh, C-suite, CEOs, CFOs, COOs uh, that, that were questioned, and, and I think some pretty valuable insights there. So if you look at these numbers, 70% of business leaders, and predominantly CEOs, CFOs, are looking to finance for their strategic decision making. And that, frankly, puts a lot of pressure on treasurers and certainly the need for there to be uh, what I, I will call the digital treasurer. Now, interestingly, um, part of this study also showed that 66% of CFOs believe that the, the path forward is actually through the data and data analytics and that that, that capability really, really important to uh, being able to drive change. But here is kind of what they really think. And so this is partly the other side of the coin. And this is a combination of the Forrester study, but also the leftmost uh, metric uh, really around a study from KPMG that was published last year. 66% of CEOs are still putting their own experiences and their gut instincts 
um, over the data-driven insights that they're getting. And that's over the last three years. So, you know, kind of concerning that as much as there's this reality for the, the, the insights from the data, there is a lack of trust. And here you'll see the next metric, and this really hammers at home, 84% of CFOs do not trust the insights from their data teams. So pretty scary numbers on, on the negative side. So as, as, as we continue along, you know, everybody's got a story of digital transformation. And just wanted to share with you, you know, some, some more metrics and to get a sense as to what technologies are very much in play uh, for the finance organizations and treasury, what's being adopted. You'll see probably the most popular is what I will call dashboarding. Uh, a lot of, you know, business intelligence combined with, you know, being able to have the, the ability to fly by wire, if you will, to understand how, how the organization is, is working. A uh, couple of really big areas on this chart, identifying artificial intelligence, uh, RPA, which seems to me I started uh, kind of evangelizing RPA about four years ago when most people were saying RP what? And uh, now it's, it's, it's actually in most people's nomenclature. We'll, we'll talk more about these. Biggest surprise to me on, on this graphic, and by the way, this is from my good friends at Treasury Strategies, uh, Jeff Diorio and company. Um, blockchain, 16%. So uh, I, th I think uh, a, a, pretty, a pretty big surprise there. So as, as I go through the talk this morning to, to really get us kicked off, I, I want to talk about a lot of digital treasurer themes. And we're, we're going to kind of blow through a lot of these because there is, there is a lot out there. And I, I think the, the role of treasurer today and the treasury organizations far more complex than it's ever been. And just before I get into it, I mean, what keynote is, is, is truly a keynote without a couple of quotes? So I wanted to pull out a couple of my, my personal favorites. So one of them, this first one, software is eating the world. And many of you may have heard this. Uh, it, was, it was quoted in the Wall Street Journal uh, of Mark Andreessen, uh, of Andreessen Horowitz. And uh, or A16Z is there, you know, another, another name of uh, the, the firms that, that uh, uh, Mr. Andreessen goes by. Back in 2011, seems like a long time now. I mean, not, not only was it pre-COVID, pre-pandemic, but we're talking it was really, at, at, you know, it was nine years ago. So a, a lot has happened then. But that was really the kickoff of uh, so much going on in, in the expanding, the ever-expanding world of software. And if you think about, you know, where an Amazon was back then, you know, Amazon was still using their cloud capabilities for Amazon long before they were offering those services to, to uh, other organizations. Now, as we flash forward, uh, you know, in, in this case, eight years, an associate of, of Mark Andreessen, and Angela Strange, made this comment last year, back in November. Every company will be a fintech company. And I think it's pretty fair to say that. Um, you know, even though many companies continue to be dealing with lots of, you know, seemingly archaic manual processes, I, I think ever more, uh, you know, just from the the buy and sell side of, of the, the organizations. There's so much more focus today on e-commerce. Um, I, I think it's fair to say that if you're not moving in this direction, um, you're, you're getting closer to that point where you're kind of a, uh, a, a left swipe uh, away uh, from being almost irrelevant. So you, you kind of got to get with the program uh, with what's going on. So the last thing, this is really not so much a quote, but I've seen this in a number of places and it certainly resonates with me. So uh, I would love to see a show of hands, but we can't really do that. Which C has been most influ influential in your digital transformation? Your CFO, your CTO, I'll even throw in there your CEO, or COVID-19? Quite amazingly, what we have seen since March and as, as this pandemic has uh, roiled the world, so to speak, is we have seen organizations really start to realize some of the things that were going on in the deep, dark crevices of some of the areas of the organization. And especially when you look at places like Treasury 
and, and its ancillary areas like AP and AR. Uh, a lot of manual processes there, and, and what's been really pretty amazing is how for, for many of the banks, and, and certainly Wells included, you know, the phone started ringing off the hook once everybody kind of got settled down in that BCP and work from home environment saying, gee, you know, those, those things you've been talking to me about, about automating my payments and automating my receivables and get, helping, helping to get rid of those checks, that finally started to become a reality and more and more companies uh, were realizing, gee, we really got to get with the program. Now, I got to tell you, it's, it's pretty amazing how um, COVID has, has in essence become one of the biggest influencers out there. Maybe not necessarily a social media influencer, but an influencer uh, no less. By the way, just want to put this out there. Um, you know, I've always enjoyed and taken pride in being an early adopter. You know, unfortunately, I was an early adopter in COVID-19, having been uh, sick back in uh, March and early April. Anyway, fortunately, feeling good, life is good, so we'll move on. So let's get to some of these themes of the digital treasurer today and, and things that we really need to be blatantly aware of. I'll start with APIs. Um, I'm not going to tell you what it stands for. If you don't know what the acronym stands for at this point, um, you know, application programming interfaces, I didn't say it. You didn't hear me say it. But a APIs literally are the glue that holds together all of the apps, all of the things that we as consumers are so used to seeing and feeling every day. It's, it's the Uber app. It's Uber Eats, which, by the way, you know, while, while uh, you know, people aren't taking necessarily the, the Ubers today uh, because we're not traveling like we were, um, Uber Eats has become a fabulous business model. You know, food delivery, we're all, we all need to eat and we're all, you know, looking for that convenience. But, you know, all those simple basic things that we're looking at on a day-to-day -day basis in those apps, like watching, you know, the different process steps as the food gets prepared, the food is, you know, loaded into either the car or is going on, you know, with the driver on a bicycle. Um, all, all of that tracking, all of that activity is a direct result of APIs. And here's the funny thing. We take APIs as if it's something, you know, brand new. It's, you know, treasury and finance, it's new. It's not new, folks. It's old. Uh, the, first, the first APIs that were used, uh, you know, coincided with kind of the explosion on, 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 the, on the World Wide Web and were really used by Salesforce.com as part of their CRM application. And, and, and that was back in 2000. And, and slightly followed within a few months by eBay. So API technology has been out there, and it is the main way of, of being able to connect all these computer systems to talk to each other, make a request, get a response, whether it's painting a map on, on a screen in a, on a cell phone, or whether it's getting uh, you know, an initiation of a, a payment through a bank, it's, it's this API technology that is really driving things. Um, you know, and believe it or not, we can combine new with, with even older things, such as, you know, an API, you might be surprised by this, but, you know, th there are APIs, Wells Fargo supports an API that actually distributes check images. So you could connect through an API to see clear checks, to see checks that have come through a lockbox, so, you know, even something that's an old technology like checks, as it's been digitized, is something that through API technology has allowed for that, that overall digital experience. So let's turn to bots. You know, it used to be we talked about bots a few years ago and everybody was doing sort of their little robot dance. I, I can't really... I don't dance well, I just have to ask any of my family members, my kids and my wife, not, not a good thing. But um, bots are in essence what we are calling the macros that are enabled through robotic process automation. And you know, I started talking about RPA about three, four years ago, and most of the time the reaction from treasury people um, was, what's, what's that? And we would often describe it as macros on steroids, because that's kind of what it felt like. Everyone was accustomed to, let's face it, all of us treasury and finance people, we know, we know our Excel. 
and and so you know you've always you've always had that one person that that one uh no offense here that that kind of that geeky person probably did a lot of forecasting and maybe some fp and a work and but they were the master of the excel spreadsheet and not only the formulas but the macros to drive all of it well one of the frightening pieces of that was the lack of control around the spreadsheet. It was just a spreadsheet. And that, that code in those macros um, was always at risk in the event that somebody got in there, didn't necessarily know what they were doing, and could potentially wreak havoc on what was you know, potentially years in development of, of getting to a point where you had a really solid forecast model that, that had been built. Well, the RPA bots, a little bit different. There are audit trails. There is system security wrapped around it so that it's not, it's not your mother's or your father's uh, Excel macro. It's entirely different. And it's actually um, bred an entire new world of, of, of software powerhouses who are you know, providing this kind of software, this automation software to companies all over the globe. I like to talk about the big three of, of RPA, which is Automation Anywhere, UiPath, and Blue Prism, not necessarily in any particular order, and this is not intended to be any kind of endorsement of any of the above, um, but they're out there. And slowly but surely, of course, big software, as I like to call it, the likes of Microsoft, SAP, IBM, have all gotten into the business, either by developing their own platforms or by acquiring another company and integrating it. Uh, IBM and SAP have gone that route. Microsoft has gone the build route. And now to go along with Microsoft's business intelligence platform, Power BI, there's now uh, Power Automate as their RPA tool. And they're looking at being able to bring all of these, these, these pieces together. So it, 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 it's an exciting time in and around the bots. I want to leave you with one other thought for all um, of the digital treasurers out there and the digital treasure wannabes. Um, you know, there's a concept around RPA that we like to refer to as the force multiplier. And it's where you've got, you've deployed a bot or a series of bots and it's used on the desktop to automate a task. And that task may be done many times during number of people using it. And so imagine that shared service center, imagine a call center where you've got dozens of people performing this task where before they literally were in the swivel chair, swiveling between two screens, maybe even three screens. I remember when we used to have to beg some of our customers, please, could you give, their, give your folks more than one screen or a little tiny screen that they've had since 1980? And so that that's evolved. But now we're, we're basically putting the oil on that swivel chair so that they don't actually have to swivel anymore. They can press a button and have the assist from a bot that does some of the, the scut work that, that they, would, they would have to do. So it's, uh, it's really brought some tremendous efficiencies uh, to, to many, many organizations. And we see more and more that are going down this path. I want to share with you a new term that I learned recently, and it, it, it's, it's very much tied to this. It's called structural secrecy. You're not gonna hear this anywhere else. I got this term from a, a new friend of mine who is the CIO of Lindy, which is an industrial gas company. Um, and um, so the, the, the idea is to um, have sort of the unspoken projects and to empower your people, whether in IT, in this particular case it was IT, or in treasury or in other financial areas, to be able to work on projects that might be you know, things that are good to have, 
um, but aren't necessarily endorsed to happen. And to get that into the DNA of people to be able to start trying things out. And the reason why I talk about this here is it's a very natural extension of the whole RPA story. Because what I've seen in talking to a lot of different companies is that their, their RPA journey will very much be about that one person. Remember I talked about you know, that Excel geek who mastered the, the macros and the, and the modeling in, in Excel? Well, today you've got a different, a different character. And I like to refer to them as the citizen programmer. And they're the ones, you know, they may have done some coding in, in school. They just have an affinity towards it. And they're, they're in this. even on a trial basis, and that one tech-savvy individual who kind of takes it upon themselves to build a bot for themselves. And it's kind of done in stealth mode. And then after they've built that bot that they're really happy with, we don't really necessarily have the next cube over, but, you know, it, it's, you know, through the Zoom call, we'll have, you know, you'll talk to your, you know, your associate who used to be in the cube next to you, and, and say, hey, I just automated this task. I just automated this, this, this every day. I pull down rates. I put it into an Excel database. And then, you know, I send those rates out to about a dozen people. Whole thing end to end takes me about 12 minutes. Well, I just built this bot and this bot is doing it for me. Well, that becomes sort of stealth. And then that, that treasury analyst, you know, kind of looks at a, couple of other things they're doing, they build some more. And then to their, their neighbor, their associates, they start saying, what kind of little things have you got? Maybe I can automate. And then we'll nation of citizen programmer and, and a little bit of this DNA to say that it's over. So I, I, I hope that's a good one. I've, I've got one more of these new terms uh, that, that we'll get to in, in the course of uh, this discussion. So I'm not going to talk a whole lot about AI, artificial intelligence, but I'll, I'll tell you, probably about 18 months ago, I was uh, sitting on the couch flipping channels, and I come across this commercial for, from Microsoft. And there's this guy who's walking across a stage, it looks like, Looks like it could be, you know, Radio City Music Hall or an op opera, uh, an opera center, um, and you know it's empty. But he's up on stage and he's pacing back and forth, and he's talking about artificial intelligence. And it occurred to me, two things occurred to me. One, you know, we're finally getting that terminology kind of out and about to the masses. That was number one. And number two, you know, it was kind of. Um, Interesting that we that Microsoft had enlisted a, a rapper, a gentleman by the name of Common, to do this. So the second thought I had was, boy, I would love to be able to integrate some of those antics into um, my talks that I give on the Treasury circuit. So I kind of done a little bit of that. But AI is out there. Um, it's doing a lot of amazing things. Organizations like Google have made some AI capabilities as easy as point and click and allowing, I'll go back to that citizen programmer comment, um, you know, allowing people to be able to go down that path and start playing and training an AI model. It could be something simple with pictures. You know, everybody probably gets annoyed when they're registering for um, like a conference like this. You have multiple, multiple registrations and you've, sometimes you get that little captcha um, is, is the name of it that comes up and wants to make sure you're a human and you have to pick the boxes that represent, you know, the school buses or the traffic lights. Well, that's actually an artificial intelligence engine capturing what people are seeing to help with um, uh, computer-aided vision. 
so that those pieces of images that us humans are helping to train that AI model to kind of figure out what's a school bus, what's a traffic light, and, and so on. So we're, we're seeing this in, 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 our, in our regular domains on a daily basis, uh, unlike ever before. Um, I will tell you the combination of artificial intelligence in conjunction with RPA, in conjunction with APIs together, and some of the other technologies that I've talked about this morning, and, and by the way, that you'll hear about over the course of, of today and tomorrow from the other speakers at this conference, um, kind of fit into a, a new area that I'm hearing more and more about. I think, I think it was uh, KPMG that may have initially um, you know, coined the term uh, extreme treasury automation. And so you're starting to see a lot of these pieces being gathered and being bolted on on top of ERP systems and on top of treasury management systems. Um, so that there is, there, there's an awful lot that's helping to automate and bring some, some real smarts to some of the things that we're doing, whether it's cash forecasting, uh, fraud detection, OFAC screening, um, you know, even, um, you know, I mentioned cash application. So a lot to get excited about here. So we're going to move to the next topic that I, that I think the digital treasurer needs to be aware of, and I think they are. So it, it's really very much the cloud. You know, for a long time, people were like, well, where's the cloud? What, what is it? Well, uh, I'm not going to go and define the cloud per se, but I'm going to tell you what's been changing. And I think has been a game changer for a lot of organizations. It's been that they've been able to move from having this on-premise software that has to be managed and maintained by IT and their vendor and having to have their own internal data centers to the cloud where providers, whether it's TMS vendor, whether it's ERP vendor, are able to actually provide the support eliminates the need for IT and let's face it facts and as much as I hate to say it and I'm a former IT guy and a former treasurer um, the reality is Treasury typically doesn't get the time of day from IT that it needs and historically for most of the big ERP systems Treasury was kind of like that annoying little area that we kind of have to build some software model modules for but no one really wanted to and that's why we had you know everybody wanted their Treasury management system well, now it's all in the cloud and whether you're doing treasury in an ERP or whether you're doing your treasury in a, a TMS or treasury workstation as I, I grew up talking about um, it's in the cloud now a really interesting stat to tell you how far along this has come um, I, I've seen this quoted in a number of, of, of disparate places 94 percent of new ERP sales and implementations are for cloud implementations. We're getting almost completely away from the on-premise implementation, which requires so much of a bigger lift for everybody involved. And, and what's interesting, we've seen in the M&A front that, um, you know, there, there's been lots of activity there. Oracle bought NetSuite, which was exclusively a cloud-based ERP. Sage went and bought Intact. And Microsoft went and bought themselves an entire portfolio of four uh, four different ERPs and now they're all running in the cloud as well. So what is a digital treasure, treasurer discussion without touching on, on emerging tech? Well, I think, um, you know, Karen Willis, who has got the session um, uh, after this one and is, is talking about a paradigm shift in treasury technology, will likely talk on some of these as well. But, you know, be aware that, you know, you need to have a comfort level with a lot of the tech that's coming at you. So whether it's artificial intelligence that we've talked about or big data or internet of things, I mean, people try to get, get their hand around IOT. And one of the examples I give is the, you know, the, the, the future of being able to, you know, let's say check in your inventory directly into your ERP through the use of RFID tags and not actually having to have people to sit there with barcodes and scanning it and getting it into the ERP. Wouldn't it be amazing if it just, it shows up, the pallets are, are enabled and boom, they're in, they're in the inventory system and you're good to go. That's one interesting example of IOT technology that could actually impact the finance area. But there's so much more. 
Um, you know, whether it's 5G, which is going to be a game changer, I don't think we're quite there yet. It's going to take some time until that's rolled out and everybody has a 5G phone. But, you know, the speed of all, all of the con connectivity that we have today and getting rid of all the latencies and stop gaps that we may have with uh, cable provided or, or copper provided um, internet capabilities is, is going to speed up the way we do everything. And last but not least, there's of course distributed ledger technology. We hear probably a lot less today than we did two years ago. Um, I, I think the buzz is gone. I think there's more understanding today that blockchain is not equal to Bitcoin. Cryptocurrencies is a whole nother story. And you know, my, my two cents worth on, on those is that, well, well, well that's nice. Uh, I think ultimately what we're looking at is probably um, you know, central banks adopting uh, fiat currencies to, you know, to become digital currencies or cryptocurrencies in their own right. Uh, we're seeing trials of that already happening in, in China. And a number of, of central banks around the globe, including the U.S. Fed, continue to investigate the viability as well as the risks associated with all of that. But these are things that, you know, Treasury has got to keep uh, a handle on and, and to monitor developments um, in the environment. So we'll keep going here. I wanna talk a little bit about um, merging technology as opposed to emerging technology. So there's a lot going on in terms of the consolidation that we're seeing in banking, in payment systems. Um, just for example, I just, you know, I was recently looking to see, you know, what, what's, what's the recent number of total banks in the U.S. And that number is, you know, it's about, it's, it's close to 5,200, long, far way down from what it was five or 10 or 15 years ago. Um, but there's a lot of consolidation going on there. You know, the, the last big merger we saw was SunTrust and bb and yielding Truist. Um, but there's lots of other interesting banking merger activity going on. A couple of recent trends that, that I would suggest you keep an eye on is the, the mergers that are taking place of credit unions actually acquiring community banks. And then fintechs buying, um, merging with banks. So there seems to be a little bit of an epidemic, mostly last year in the state of Indiana, credit unions buying banks. Um, the, the, the fintech space has been a lot less, but recently um, there, was, there was a transaction, a small, fairly under the radar fintech called Jico um, acquired a, a, a small community bank in, in Minneapolis and that, that fintech was in Minneapolis. I'm expecting we'll see more of that kind of activity going on. Um, another fintech called Lending Club. Um, also, likewise, bought uh, a bank called Radius Bank. So you've got that. You've got these other elements of consolidation where you, you're getting these hybrid organizations, not just fintechs, but tech fins, tech banks, um, and, and so on. And certainly, the payments ecosystem has seen a ton of big acquisitions over the course of the last year uh, or, or two, actually. Global Payments and TSIS. MasterCard Transactus, FIS WorldPay, Fiserv and First Data. So the landscape on all of these things is changing. And why is this so important to keep tabs on? It's important because it gives Treasury the opportunity to keep an eye on what their service levels are, what the services are, and to be able to start to look at how they can further rationalize the services that they're using. And, you know, in a lot of cases we're seeing as a result of, of, of the, the merger activity, there, there is, a, you know, a, a desire to say, okay, well, depending on how your, your integration goes, we may want to look at a different player to, to solve for us. Um, so uh, it, 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 it makes for, um, you know, a new landscape, I think, for everybody in Treasury uh, to keep their eyes on. So people, so I've got my people behind me and they've been, they've been pretty quiet. Um, actually, you guys have all been quiet too, but that's because you're on mute. But people, this is a really important equation. And I know you may say, well, people, digital, you know, how's that all fit? Well, the people are, are really the smarts that, that we need to have. And I think as we look at doing more and more automation, the profile 
of, of who we're hiring, um, the people that we want to have in Treasury changes a little bit. You know, I, I think, um, you know, as I've, 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 I've touched on that citizen programmer concept a few times, I, you know, I, I think there's a need to bring in some really tech savvy folks to help drive the change and the, the digital experiences that you need in the finance area. And, and you know, as, as part of that, you know, I, 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 I suggest to you that, that, you know, you look in some unusual places when you start doing your hiring. Look within your organization, within places like IT. You may find folks who have got that savvy because it's what they've been trained to do professionally and get them to be able to help you, but do it inside your organization as opposed to being on the other side of, of the fence over in IT. Bring them in. Lots of them are, are dying for that experience. I, you know, it's interesting over the years, I've seen a number of people who have gone from treasury or accounting roles over to IT and likewise from IT to treasury. I, in fact, came from that environment. I started my career, I won't tell you how many years ago, but um, you know, back when there was a big eight set of, of, of accounting and consulting firms, um, you know, I was on the IT consulting side and um, you know, I, I, I've made that transition a couple of times. Um, the, the, the point is a lot of the treasury, a lot of the finance, unless you're doing something that is like technical accounting or you're dealing with derivatives and swaps, and in a lot of cases there too, this can be learned. So it's really important to realize that A, we still need people, really, really important. The profile though, a little bit different. We wanna up the game in terms of the technical savvy and capability of what we've got there. So I wanna talk about data and we're, we're kind of getting towards the end here. Um, you know, I've always said it's all about the data and it's kind of interesting with a lot of the tools and, and big data as a concept, people say to me, Seth, what, what exactly is big data? And, and do I, in, in my company, do I have it? And I'll, I'll often ask, well, do you have an ERP system? They're like, yeah, check. Do you have a TMS? They're like, yeah, check. Do you have a CRM? Check. They're like, oh, by the way, I actually have two ERPs because we bought this other division. And so they're still running on a different system. And so I've got all these challenges in consolidating and really doing analysis across the enterprise. And I'm like, well, when you talk about all those different pieces, you've got big data. And what a lot of organizations are doing, and historically, they would build themselves a data warehouse. Today, we're talking about data lakes. And similar concept, it's a place where you're gonna have all that information ported so that you know exactly what kind of outcome, what kind of analytical work you wanna do, and you have it housed someplace so it's not, not just in your transactional systems. And it allows you to do a lot of that business intelligence analysis, a lot of that smart dashboarding that you wanna do for your executive teams. Um, it becomes really, really important. And by the way, folks, you can't do any artificial intelligence unless you've got data. Data is kind of the fuel that makes AI go. And so here's the problem. It's as relevant today as it was 5, 10, 15, 20 years ago, is that garbage in, garbage out. There is a lot of data out there that frankly has got to get cleaned up. And you know, usually it's a line item on a project plan when you're doing that ERP conversion or upgrade or the TMS upgrade. It's not a line item, folks. What it really is, it's a continuous process. We need to be continually scrubbing the data, making sure that we've got the right vendors, the right customers, the relationships between uh, different customers, depending on how they're, they're architected from a legal entity perspective. Same thing with the banks. And it's not static, it changes. And I guarantee you there's somebody in our audience today that probably still has in one of their systems a reference to Wachovia in their banking, even though that Wachovia acquisition by Wells Fargo happened a dozen years ago. Anyway, um, the point being, the data is really, really significant. And here's the other interesting thing, tools we've talked about today, RPA, AI, um, actually can be used to help us monitor and continually look for exceptions and do the data scrubbing we need so that we can get to a state of having really pristine data so that the analytics that we get, remember, 84% of CFOs don't trust the data. 
So we've got to get to a point where the CFOs trust their data. And the only way we can do it is by making sure that it's really as close to perfect as possible. So no discussion is complete without talking global. Um, the only thing I'm really going to talk here is, is just, you know, some of the, the global standards as we see it as relates to payments. And I know there's, there's a session I'm, I'm, I'm expecting to attend as well. Uh, I believe tomorrow talking about um, ISO 20022. Um, you know, that is a global payment standard. We're seeing that as new rails um, around the globe are being implemented. So, you know, real-time payment rails, similar to um, RTP here in, here in the U.S. It's been uh, stood up by Clearinghouse. You know, the focus on having, you know, this global standard of the data and the information, that payload that goes along with the payment, uh, becomes ever so critical to allow for whether you're making a payment to a company down the block, making a payment to a, a company on the other side of the country, or a payment to somebody on the other side of the globe. Having the data that allows you to reconcile, them to reconcile, really allows um, all, all of that to be able to come into focus and re work really well. So I have one last thing that I'm going to share with you. I promised that there was going to be one other new term, and, and, and hopefully this will be a new term for you. Um, and, and that term, a uh, friend of mine at Wells Fargo, uh, Ron Schmidt, shared this one with me, and, and it so resonated with me. And this is nothing to do with digital, but I think it's a really important takeaway. Intelligent disobedience. Now, we all know that fraud is rampant out there especially payment fraud and business uh, email compromise fraud. So, you know, sometimes it can be internal fraud. And I actually experienced this, saw this happen when I, and back in my, in my practitioner days at GE, and where, you know, someone, you know, in power in a senior level, you know, tells you directly that there's a payment that needs to be made. And I actually saw, you know, a fraud perpetrated, saw it after the fact. Um, where people went along with it because a person in power told them to do something. And they wired money to an entity that did not belong to the enterprise. It was all fraudulent. But the same thing, the fraudsters out there, which are even more out there today in, in the uh, COVID world that, that we're living in, um, are getting into email systems, are getting into our, our other operating systems, and they are you know, faking us out to thinking that it's the CEO, it's the CFO. You've been called upon to help with a secret deal. You can't tell anybody. Well, the whole idea is even if it seems real, check, confirm. If a vendor's changing their payment instructions, is it real or is it fraud, a fraud attempt? So intelligent disobedience, it's kind of like when the seeing eye dog is, you know, realizing that there's a car that's potentially going to hit their uh, person that they're helping, um, you need to be able to stop, think, ask the question, even if it means you're questioning a senior leader. And so what I say to you folks that are CFOs, that are treasurers, make that known. Make that known to your C-suite. Make that known to your staff to be willing to question and that it's okay to question. It's really, really important in this day and age. So let me kind of come back to and wrap up the digital treasurer. You know, a lot of trends. There's, there's so much. We could spend, could spend hours talking about many of the subjects. I've tried to paint some broad brush strokes. But I, I, I wanted to touch on a lot of them because I knew that there was going to be a deeper dive later today and tomorrow on a number of these topics. Um, it, it, it's so important to get your arms around it. Um, one of the last things I'm going to talk about also not digital is just the relationship between treasurer and CFO. There's a bit of what I call the BFF thing going on. CFOs are more and more so relying on treasury and their treasurers to get strategic work done. And in order to get to that kind of project work and to keep a CFO happy, you've got to have a highly automated, a highly real time, a highly digital organization that can take on all the challenges that we're living in here in 2020. So with that, um, uh, you know, I hope everybody has a fabulous conference. Learn a lot. Be sponge. I always tell folks that. And uh, enjoy the, uh, this great Elir uh, Treasury experience. And I think we have 
uh, some time for a couple of questions. Thank you, Seth. Yes, we did have a couple of questions come through the chat. A quick reminder, um, if you guys do have questions you want Seth to answer, feel free to submit them through the Q&A function or the chat to panelists. Uh, first question, so what software vendors are your clients using to build data lakes? Snowflake, AWS, Microsoft, et cetera. Uh, yeah, <laughs> to, to name a few. Um, there, you know, what, what I usually suggest is, you know, in addition to, um, you know, what, what I see from customers, um, I have become very reliant on, on, on two sets of surveys. Um, um, I always look at what uh, Gartner's uh, Magic Quadrant has to say and the Forrester Wave, probably the two best sources of, you know, just about any technology and uh, you know you, you would be able to see that it's kind of interesting. Snowflake mentioned because of course that was this hugely hot IPO that just uh, was just launched into the public markets. Um, data data is king. Um, if if cash isn't king, which I, I think it is too, then then data would be a close second. So sorry for the indirect you know indirect answer on that one. Thank you. And you did mention, obviously, a lot of different technologies, a lot of new trends. Where should the non-tech savvy treasurer get informed if they want to dive deeper on this emerging tech? So that's a great question. You know, you've, you know, I think every treasury organization has got a number of partners. You know, you should be talking regularly to your bankers. You should be talking regularly to any of the vendors that are supporting you. So whether it's your ERP vendor, whether it's your TMS vendor, um, whether it's, you know, if you have any work that's being done um, by uh, both uh, external and internal auditors, you've got an entire um, ecosystem there of people that I would suggest that you reach out to and, and regularly ask about uh, the trends that are going on and what, what they're seeing with their other customers, how it's being applied. What you want to listen for are those real world use cases that will resonate with you and can be examples of things that you could do as well. And kind of piggybacking off of that, um, how should senior management within Treasury become more tech savvy without getting too deep into the weeds? Like any recommendations there? Um, I, I like to say, you know, it, it's, it kind of falls into the area of what I would say is continuous learning. You know, if once you stop learning new things, you're kind of you're stuck and you're going backwards. So whether it's um, you know various newsletters, email blogs. I mean, I, I I personally have so many of those that it's part of my morning routine every day is is to get in and kind of go through um, the newsletters that have come in and the blogs and read them and highlight them and. You know, for folks that follow me on LinkedIn, I, I, I do tend to post a lot of things that I find that are interesting, either around banking, technology, management, and leadership. Um, you know, so th those are sort of the, the best ofs of things that I'm coming across. So I, I, I would say that that's one place. And, and probably the other thing, we're in this unique time right now where so many of us are working from home and we have the opportunities to be able to take an hour out here or an hour out there. There is so much um, online uh, training and conference content. So much of it doesn't have a price tag associated with it. I strongly recommend that you, you, know, you, you, you keep tabs on, on things that are being offered and um, you know, go listen, learn, and, and talk to your colleagues, probably best thing. This is something we're doing at the uh, at Manny, the Treasury Management Association of New York. We're working on some virtual roundtables to bring practitioners together to bounce ideas off of one another. So if you get those kinds of opportunities through an AFP group or some of the banks are doing these things, um, Wells has been doing C-suite roundtables, all of those kinds of things are great opportunities to continue to learn about all of this technology that's happening. Excellent, thank you, Seth. With that, we have come to the end of our keynote. Um, for those of you who are continuing on the ETE journey with us, we do have our next session, a paradigm shift in treasury technology, which begins at 11 a.m. Central, so in about 10 minutes here. The link to join that next webinar is available in the chat. 
Seth will be available on Twitter as well as via his information here, answering any questions that you have throughout the conference. Um, and with that, thank you so much, Seth, for your time and everyone have a great rest of their day. Thanks, everybody. Enjoy the conference.